Uh, this is yep. So I'll say that again. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you to panel number seven, which is role playing game design uh, specifically. And uh, I speak as a role playing game designer that I'm ecstatic to have these voices uh, uh, talk about a number of different core issues in, in RPG design, especially as uh, you know, the practitioners reflect on on the, the various aspects of the craft. And our, for our first um, panelists today, we have uh, Mike Deanda and Carly Kukurik. I'm going to introduce them both. And I believe that Mike will give um, that then his uh, talk on Golden Mark. So if Mike, you want, want to activate your um, video, and if you have any screen sharing, you can set that up and I will introduce both of you as authors of the paper. Hi, thanks, Evan. Um, can would you mind giving Carly? Uh, yeah, I, I, I was good. I, I want to get Carly in here as well. It's actually I was like, what's going on? So, the today is glitch day. So let's make sure that 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 Carly is properly promoted. Thank you. Yeah, this is up. Oh, there we go. Okay. So so again, both of you should be talking, and I'm going to introduce both of you as panelists. Great. Okay, and there we go. All right, so um, uh, Michael Anthony Deanda, uh, PhD, is a professional lecturer in game design at DePaul University. Deanda researches the intersection of games, queerness, and culture, considering the intimacies between LGBTQ and Latina lived experiences in games, and using game design as research practice, Deanda develops games that draw comment on privileged structures uh, using inter intersectionality, queerness, and feminism as critical lenses. Deanda is published in Technical Communications Quarterly, the Journal of Popular Culture, the Video Game Art Readers, Queer Studies in Media and Popular Culture, and Wider Screens. Carly Kokurik, um, Carly A. Kokurik is the Associate Professor of Digital Humanities and Media Studies at, and Director of the Graduate Program in Technology and Humanities at the Illinois Institute of Technology. She's the author of two books, uh, Coin Operated Americans, Rebooting Boyhood at the Video Game Arcade um, by University of Minnesota Press in 2015, and Brenda Laurel, uh, Pioneering Games for Girls, uh, Bloomsbury Academic 2017. Uh, I've read them both and they are excellent. Uh, her articles have appeared in journals such as the American Journal of Play, Game Studies, Technical Communication Quarterly, Visual Studies, Velvet Light Trap, uh, Ada New Media, Media, and other journals. She's also written about games and cultures for outlets like The Washington Post, Vice, Motherboard, and Reverse Shot. She's a practicing game designer, and her games have been showcased at events like different games and the Word Play Festival. I give the mic over to the both of you. Thank you for being here. Great, thank you. So Mike, I think you're up first, yeah? There we go. Yes. Uh... Great, uh, so thanks everyone for being here for our presentation. Uh, we're really excited to be talking about this small weird game uh, that we made last year uh, and have recently launched the Kickstarter for. So uh, thank you, Evan, for that introduction. I'm Michael Deanda and I will be presenting with uh, Carly Kusurik about Golden Mart, um, a game that we designed for isolation during uh, lockdown and COVID. Um, so Golden Mart is a uh, solo TTRPG uh, that we designed as part of Neighbor Jam last year that was hosted by Keelan. Uh... Oh man, I'm blanking. Uh, who is a um, grad student at the University of Chicago. I will link to his uh, or their um, Twitter chat in the Discord. Um, but this event was supposed to focus on looking at um, what the cornerstones of neighborhoods were during COVID and during lockdown and uh, the Black Lives Matter protests. And so uh, Carly, 
approached me to design a uh, role-playing game about a convenience store. Um, so to talk about the um, experience design behind this game, uh, we, we started from this idea of convenience store, um, Keelan Doyle Myerskoff, I was getting ahead of myself. Uh, it was the organ organizer of Neighbor Jam. Um, and one of the suggestions that we really latched onto was a narrative about your local corner store. Um, and we took this idea of convenience store and inserted um, the idea of magical realism into it. Carly, I'll let you take it from here, sorry. Yeah, so I, I mean, I read tons of fantasy, but I was also especially interested, I'm especially interested in magic that just kind of occurs, but is taken as, as normal. Um, and so it's like, what if it's a convenience store and it's just a convenience store, but also it's really weird, right? But it's still just a convenience store, right? Like this isn't spectacular. It's just part of the day-to-day -day there. Um, and so we really started kind of brainstorming different touchstones for that. And I was... Um, I don't know why I got really fixated on the rats of Nim um, and kind of like hyper intelligent rats. Um, you know, the, the phrase strange things are foot at the circle K, which is from Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Um, the way things can be both tedious and highly um, chaotic and crisis at the same time. This is always the feeling I think in like a hospital. I think for many of us um, who were in relatively safe positions, a lot of the experience of the pandemic has been like that, where it's like, things are really bad, but I'm fine, I think, right? Um, uh, the movie Clerks, um, our own neighborhood convenience stores, we're both in Chicago and convenience stores absolutely are, are the glue that holds much of the city together. Um, I'm always fascinated by normal people as heroes, uh, weekly world type news headlines, which I also associate with kind of like everyday life and, and corner stores. Um, real crises and catastrophes, but also magical ones. And then the way that we're always alone, but we're also never alone, right? And that was something I thought was really key as well. So, yeah. So we started looking at different kinds of things that we associate with kind of retail jobs um, and, and kind of like the, the geography of the city or of corner stores, right? Like people coming in just to use the bathroom. I think everyone has been in a gas station to use the bathroom at some point. Um, the dumpsters out back, which are always kind of creepy, right? Um, the, the idea of incident reports is something that's always stuck with me. I've had multiple jobs where I had to do these. And like I had um, a summer job with small children where I had to do these all the time. And they always sounded really bizarre because the things a five-year-old do, does are erratic and strange and having to like try and write this in this very formal report where it's like well this child did this totally bonkers thing and scratched their head and then I put a band-aid on their head but I forgot to wear gloves so now I'm filling out an incident report right like um and so it's just like this is my life now right um employee handbooks which are often very um sterile and weird um and then I got really in the idea of the kind of randomness of candy. Um, and so instead of like thinking about randomness through dice, but thinking it through kind of like the kinds of things you buy in a corner store. Um, so I think we're ready for the next slide then. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'm gonna talk about uh, the research and concept mapping that we did for the game. Um, during the time that we were designing this game, I just moved uh, neighborhoods and so, um, this game and going to like check out the, the convenience stores was really a way that I uh, oriented myself in, in the new neighborhood that I was I was living in. So that really helped me uh, situate myself in the neighborhood, but also was kind of a, a, an interesting way to approach this uh, game design. So from our brainstorming, uh, we started thinking about these various parts of like the, what makes up a convenience store experience or what people go in. Um, as they experience as customers, uh, the convenience store, but also what workers might do. Um, and so Carly talked a bit a bit about using uh, like snack type things as randomizers. Um, and this is what really uh, drove a lot of the design of the game. This use of, we started with M&Ms as the, the core randomizer of the game. So I, I looked up the ratio of colors and then we thought about that as a randomizer for the RPG. And there is one table that we have in the game um, that shows how uh, the colors map onto different aspects of the storytelling game. So as a single player uh, tabletop role playing game, um, we wanted to be forward about it that um, it, it's 
it's a tool for you to tell a story with um, and that you are in charge of the story that you're telling. And this is more of a framework to help you do that. Um, and so to start off the game, uh, the, the player randomizes some kind of magical catastrophe. And that's the table that you're seeing here that ranges from a riot uh, down to something like a sink, a magical sinkhole opens up and it's sucking in the, um, the neighborhood around you. And this is happening, you know, a couple blocks down from where you're working. Um, from this idea of M&Ms as the randomizer, we wanted to think about um, what if people don't have M&Ms during lockdown? We were thinking about designing this game during lockdown for people experiencing isolation. And so we didn't want them to go, have to go get M&Ms if they didn't have them uh, for fear of, uh, you know, getting infected. So we, we were thinking of like what other snacks people like that come in variants of six. And so <laughs> we were thinking of Chex Mix for like a savory option, um, M&Ms for people who like sweet and chocolatey things. And then like, if, if you don't have either of those, you can use a D6. Um, and there's ways to play with that uh, in the game as well. So the, the core thing that the, you know, is the game book. Um, in this case, we made the game book an employee handbook and I used like kind of corporate looking clip art for the whole thing. This was inspired partially by um, David Byrne did a whole series of art using PowerPoint and they totally just look like PowerPoint, but like weird. Um, and I kind of love taking really routine forms and breaking them a little bit. Um, so it has your instructions, it has a map, it has rules and how to play. Um, your character sheet is an application. Um, and then of course there's the incident report. And the nice thing with the incident report is it gives you kind of an artifact at the end. Um, so it's actually something you're making through that process of play. So next slide. Yeah, that, that's a nice, uh, Throwback to the presentation yesterday about keepsakes. Just wanted to throw that in there. Um, so the the last part that we were thinking about was the the dumpster, and this is where uh, you keep track of the namesake or the yeah the the game states and progressions. Um, so as you are pulling randomizers, uh, M Ms or Chex Mix or whatever. Um, you're either eating them or you are adding them to this pile. Uh, in the dumpster spot to keep track of different game states. And then once you have a certain number of colors or a certain number of each color, the game ends and you either make it through your shift uh, as a convenience store worker or the city gets swallowed by whatever the catastrophe was. Yeah, and then this is just the, the incident report kind of showing what it looks like. Um, I wrote an article in 2013 about feelies and about kind of like the physical aspects of specifically digital games that come packaged with these, but it's really about kind of giving a game a tactile experience and kind of thinking about what does it have to have the artifacts of that world in your hands. Um, and this, of course, is something that computer games in the early 1980s and late 1970s did really heavily and really successfully, um, but it's also something that's often actually quite expensive. So this is kind of like a lo-fi and expensive way to do something that feels real or real-ish, right? Like it's real enough for the world that we've built. So I think um, Mike's gonna talk about these, but we had some really fun uh, playtest feedback. <laughs> uh, yeah, so in, in playtesting the game, uh, primarily what we were going for was this idea of magical realism and a convenience store. And I just point that out because uh, when we were playtesting, we actually got a lot of interesting um, comments that really emphasize these two, uh, much like the one that says that the game was quite tedious, which felt appropriate for role playing in the service industry, which I found hilarious. Um, another one was uh, that the game was uh, cynical at, in the life of a minimum wage worker, um, that it's Lovecrafting in its bleakness, um, and left the, the player feeling like they weren't even supposed to be here today in their playtesting session. Um, and then the middle one was like, um, we, we got a, a story from one of our playtesters that had their um, game experience that they actually journaled out playing. Um, and we thought that was a cute little anecdote about having to order an exorcism for uh, dealing with somebody who's possessed. Um, but yeah, we, we thought that making these on signs was a cute way of showcasing that. 
So what we're working on now is we're kickstarting a print version of the game and also expanding the digital version. Um, there is a fully playable version on um, itch. It's pay what you will. You can have it for free. I would love for you to play it. We would love for you to play it. Um, but we really were interested in the idea of kind of building out the world a little more and also like leaning into that physicality a little more so you actually get like a real copy and we're trying to print maps and some things like that. Um, so if you're interested in the game, um, I hope you'll consider backing it or at least looking at it. Um, and that's actually about it. Thank you so much. Um, here's our last slide. Um, we're closed, that's it. And we'll be happy to talk during the Q&A as well. Thank you very much. Thanks to both of you. And I, I appreciate uh, the, the, the tactile games. And of course, we're all, we're all very keepsake happy here. So, uh, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm equally happy that there's a Kickstarter going on for this game. And um, that that you talk through your specific RPG design decisions is actually the, the entire intention of this panel. So this is awesome. Our next uh, speaker will be Jose Reta. So Jose, you can turn on your video and get set. I will give you your introduction. Okay, should be good. I don't have any slides. I am for doing this right now. <laughs> okay, yeah, great. So let's let's go for it. Jose Reta doesn't let imminent death stop them. Rather, death is allowed to delay them for a time before it takes a backseat to other more important matters. After spending time away from higher education due to health issues, Jose Reta returned and completed their undergraduate and master's programs in five years, earning bachelor degrees in political science and Mexican American studies, and later a master's in interdisciplinary studies and master's certificate in gender and women's studies. They've been playing tabletop RPGs since the age of 12 and marvels at their growth from niche hobby to a cultural juggernaut. They have contributed to this by coordinating with their local public library to host weekly gaming sessions and public events for the past few years. Over time, Jose Reta has learned that the only thing more enjoyable than playing games is talking about what playing games can mean to themselves and others. So absolutely welcome. And, and we look forward to what you have to say. Thank you. Um, yeah, so... Uh, as Evan mentioned, I've been playing for a very long time, and um, one of the things that surprised me um, most about the recent social media discourse when it comes to TTRPGs is just uh, how often you read uh, marginalized people, people of color, queer people, trans people, uh, discuss what playing means to them, right? What it did for them uh, internally. And as I was I'm doing my readings for my coursework and my master's degree, uh, I came across uh, material for uh, a Chicano feminist philosopher who was very concerned with uh, what real and imagined spaces could do to impact identity of a person. And this, of course, uh, seems to dovetail very well with, uh, with my interest in, in games and this hobby. So uh, there has been a discussion about how TTRPG play kind of influences participants as they kind of navigate the worlds that they create. Uh, in the moment. Uh, Shay's uh, discussion of virtual edge work uh, back in 2015 kind of helps categorize the positive personal benefits players uh, get out of it as they deal with the obstacles that they get it in every game session. Um, Bowman and Kemper and covering TTRPGs and LARPs uh, have discussed the concepts of bleed and the related emancipatory bleed. Uh, in both, uh, of course, uh, the emotional states of both the player and the persona uh, aren't very clearly divided and they move back and forth and inform each other. Um, Kemper herself, um, when discussing emancipatory bleed, uh, actually described how it provided a space for personal agency and determination for her, that even though the LARP that she was uh, participating in uh, was replicating some very strict social structures. Um, and that combination of being able to discover herself uh, in this uh, oppressive state uh, made her feel stronger, better, gave her, gave her an affirmation for herself. And while there is some commonality between these sorts of discussions, um, I feel that there is a little bit of a missing framework that could be used to uh, cover not just instances like these, but uh, moments where players alternately achieve a level of edge work uh, without meaning to, or uh, moments when they intentionally seek out a level of bleed from play. Um, so originally, 
Um, this was to be uh, just a, a basic discussion on greed. However, um, the readings of the Chicano philosopher Gloria Zadua uh, kind of put forward something that is perhaps analogous to both of these uh, ideas and can maybe be used to, as we said before, frame uh, the discussion, particularly the idea of border theory. Um, in this case, it's using it as a site of origin to discuss how play can impact players, um, as well as kind of show how the metaphorical spaces that are typically discussed in border theory can also be used to um, examine the act of play itself. Um, so this discussion uh, that I'm having here uh, really just comes from an observation of general conceits of, uh, of play, uh, including things like social contracts that are, are used when you have an open and healthy table, uh, how play is structured in the physical and virtual spaces, uh, as well as uh, general platicas uh, with my all trans and queer uh, group of five people. Um, now, that original, or first I should say, uh, methodology is uh, one is that's just viewing how the game space works, right? Uh, the space where the players gather, which we're going to refer to as a table, even though now, of course, we have things like Zoom and Skype and all that uh, to allow uh, people from all over the, the world to, to connect. Uh, there's also the players who enact the roles uh, of the characters and the characters themselves, uh, which are used as almost pawns to navigate and uh, interact with the imaginative space. The Chicana Feminist Platica methodology, however, which was uh, put forward by Figueros and Ricardo Bernal, uh, actually allows for the participants of the Platica to uh, be co-constructors of knowledge. It helps them connect their own lived experiences with the research and also establishes a level of reciprocal trust between uh, the subjects and uh, the researcher. And in a lot of cases, the researcher themselves are a uh, part of the research. Uh, so it's best to have that uh, trust and uh, familiarity between everyone in order to get um, an accurate accounting of the data. Now, uh, these unstructured platicas uh, took place over the course of about 15 months, uh, both before and after gaming sessions, uh, usually when the excitement for the game was at its highest. And from these platicas, a discourse analysis was conducted, looking for themes and commonalities in participants' answers. Uh, platicas themselves were chosen uh, as a method method yeah, methodology uh, in order to take advantage of the pretty subjective nature of TTRPG play. Um, platicas allow for conversation to occur and clarification uh, within that conversation, which uh, might not have occurred if uh, it were a one-to-one -one where uh, perhaps the uh, subject would have gotten nervous or forgetful uh, uh, regarding some answers and platicas allow for everyone to contribute at once, um, remind uh, others about certain things or, or help uh, spur a discussion that may not have been uh, approached during a normal interview. Now, uh, the participants in these platicas were myself as both researcher and player, uh, w, a trans woman who was drawn into TTRPGs about nine years ago. Uh, B, a non-binary player and W spouse who began playing six years ago. G, a biromantic asexual woman who began playing TTRPGs in late 2019. And K, a trans woman who started playing TTRPGs about five years ago. Uh, now, uh, to define border theory before we move on, um, as stated before, it was originally theorized by, by Gloria Anzaldúa, who was a uh, queer Chicana woman from the Texas-Mexico border. Um, it extended from her own examination of the multiple marginalities that uh, she faced starting from a very, very young age. Uh, her existence was essentially antithetical to the white heteronormative patriarchal structure of larger American culture and to the very similar structure that's present in a lot of Mexican culture. Uh, additionally, her geographical location meant that she was never truly seen as either American or Mexican uh, due to signifiers that contradicted both nationalist images. Uh, to her, uh, a political border overlapped with a racial border, a gendered border, a sexual border, um, in some cases even with the border of language, uh, considering that she spoke both English and Spanish, both with an accent and both with words that uh, were altered from their usage in either uh, original language. 
she considered a border to be una herida abierta, uh, which is an open wound uh, that exists between two social states that ends up bleeding across both and creates its own border culture. Uh, the border culture is important as it exists as a nebulous, constantly created state that is informed by both sides, but actually beholden to neither. Um, she posited that all marginalized existed within this border state, within a third space that created, uh, that's created throughout the entire social, mental, political, physical violences that the marginalized uh, face on a daily basis. This third space, which she labeled Nepantla after a Nafa term for the middle, is where that violence is negotiated. Uh, those within Nepantla must learn how to deal with the impact of violent socialization that often runs counter to their own self-image. Um, questions like, is now a good time to come out? Am I safe in this space? How much danger I, am I in right now? Are all examples of Nepantla at work. By answering these questions, the subject is determining for themselves how honest they can be in that moment. But I want to put forward another version of Nepantla, one that is entered semi-intentionally, uh, cautiously, even probably, uh, but one that is not triggered by outside violence and uh, still manages to take that violence into account. It's a version of Nepantla that requires the same level of evaluation and self-determination, uh, but on the terms of the bordered person. Taking the metaphorical ge geography that Anza Dua lays out in her work, uh, we can actually explore the similarities between it and the play space of a TTRPG session. Uh, the rules and expected interactions will vary between game systems. Um, there are three commonalities that are found between them all. Uh, first, as mentioned before, it's the space where the group uh, shares, uh, namely the table. Uh, there is also the players themselves. Uh, for my group, uh, many were young, uh, ranging from about the late 20s to uh, early 20s, and their first exposure with the concept of RPGs was actually through video games. Uh, all stated that the original concept of role-playing games was defined by video games like Mass Effect and Dragon Age, and three of them, G, K, and B, uh, each discussed feeling like something was missing when they played that way. Uh, primarily for them, uh, it was the idea that these were not their choices. Uh, they felt that they would have made different choices, uh, in those in those moments, but they were basically railroaded uh, by the writers. Uh, and of course, when learning about the TTRPGs through like, social media, Twitter, Tumblr, YouTube, Twitch, uh, they left at the chance to actually tell stories the way they wanted to. Uh, third are the player characters, uh, the fictional personas that players and acts to use and use to navigate the situations that arise in play. Uh, of course, these are all limited by the genre that's being emulated by the rules, but um, generally everyone's considered competent and skilled. And it's here that every player had stories about playing other genders and sexualities. Uh, both G and W admitted to intentionally creating PCs to test the waters for themselves. Uh, G used the alibi of creating a heterosexual male PC to smooth talk women non-player characters following the game. And W admitted that her PCs were all women in order to have some experience with that gender before affirming her own trans identity for herself. Uh, B, B and K uh, both discussed how they later saw patterns in their decisions during PC creation and, and play that they took as signs of knowing myself before I knew, um, as stated by K. And for myself, it wasn't until reading trans and non-binary experiences that I realized the likely reason I felt more comfortable portraying a variety of genders uh, all at once as a GM, because I'm a forever GM, uh, was because I did not truly identify as the, the man I was uh, assigned at birth. Um, so within our podcast, some common phrases, sorry about the car, common phrases uh, included things like, uh, I wanted to try something else, be something else, I wanted to see what happened when. Uh, this is all placed on a background of being unable to attempt these things for themselves away from the table. The act of play actually served to obfuscate things uh, or in ways to define oneself uh, by saying it was just a game uh, while deciding what to do with the glee that they actually experienced during the play. Uh, the descriptions of play from marginalized players 
all hint at pushing a boundary that they were not at physically uh, or not able to physically, socially, emotionally due to um, dominant hegemonic uh, ideals. But again, the alibi of a cooperative fantasy allowed them to, uh, to have that level of safety. Uh, they achieved a, some emotional reward uh, that eventually allowed them to better define themselves in real life. Um, basically moments of emancip emancipatory bleed like these were uh, present in each of the players and myself. And frankly, I find it very difficult to believe that other marginalized people don't experience something similar. Now, I propose that the act of playing in a TTRPG can create its own bordered state, a form of nepotma that is simultaneously individualized uh, since each player brings to it their own desires and expectations, but also communal uh, because these expectations are then expressed to the group at the table and informed by uh, their reactions. Um, the individual aspect of TTRPG play is completely analogous to the Nipatma state discussed by Mvaldua, but the communal chain, uh, nature of it is actually what uh, changes uh, this form of Nipatma into something that is uh, self-reflective and gives it a level of social reflection um, at a healthy table, at least. Uh, players can be expected to express vulnerabilities without any fear of mockery or reprisal, um, thus getting some amount of positive feedback that can be incorporated by the player once outside the game. Now, taking Chicana feminist epistemology and applying it to a tabletop role-playing game might uh, appear a little far-fetched, especially when we have other works analyzing portions of how TTRPGs can hold players or help players uh, get something out of, uh, out of it for themselves. But uh, I do feel that these sorts of studies might benefit from having a framework that incorporates many of these fields and works while also centering marginalized needs and stories. Um, I do believe that there's actually much more uh, when it comes to using border theory and Anzaldua's work overall uh, to examine TTRPGs. Uh, she does have a lot of work when it comes to the importance of art on the individual and on social change that can probably apply here as well. Um, it can also probably be used to examine how social social systems within rules uh, can also enact levels of marginalization that then have to be again navigated by the players um, or how the systems themselves can help support play uh, that's aimed to create uh, a bordered state um, and there's several games that have been discussed throughout this uh, this conference that help with that um, and also i do think it is very important to begin viewing rpgs uh, through non-traditional lenses. Uh, Kemper has done this when bringing up Du Bois's uh, double consciousness, and it needs to continue. Uh, using epistemological methods developed by marginalized people may actually help explain what they get out of these activities, experiences, and ideas. Um, the thing is, really, we are all, in one way or another, playing from a wounded state when we sit at the table. And by acknowledging that, and looking at what results we might get a deeper insight into this hobby. Thank you, Jose, and a round of applause for an excellent talk that's right on time and, and very, very much also a, a, a very timely talk as well. Um, we, 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 again, stick around for the, for the Q&A and, and we'll have lots to discuss. Our next presenters are going to be uh, talking about uh, character keepers and they've stayed up really late in Germany. Um, so I will uh, introduce them in alphabetical order. Um, uh, for, for, well, for, for, first of all, um, uh, Adrian and Garrett, are you both there? We are here. Wonderful. Are here. You can, you, you, you're welcome to set up your slides and, and I will introduce you both as I do it. Um, so uh, we have Adrian Hermann, and Adrian Hermann is a professor of religion and society at the um, Forum Internationale Wissenschaft at the University of Bonn in Germany. You tell my German professor, right? Uh, he specializes in the global history of religion in the 19th and 20th centuries, and recently has begun to engage in the field of role-playing game studies. 
He teaches in various cultural studies and media studies, uh, bachelor's and master's programs at the University of Bonn, including courses on tabletop role-playing games and an introduction to game studies. After being an avid uh, TRPG player through most of the 1990s, he has recently once more taken up both playing, but also now studying TRPGs as part of his investigations of contemporary audio, audiovisual and digital media. Uh, the other panelist, um, equal in stature, is Garrett Reininghaus, who is an active role player, RPG designer, and community organizer, uh, a force of nature, I'll add. Uh, he has coined the term uh, live action online game or LAUG, uh, L-A-O-G, for the framework of uh, framework freeform RPGs and LARPs, which are explicitly designed for online play. Uh, benefiting fully from the, this medium and its potential for creative design. He's been involved in character keeper design since the very beginning and follows the development of this format actively as the administrator of the largest free repository on the subject, the Gauntlet's Play Aids folder. Garrett has a diploma in mathematics and philosophy of science from Humboldt University Berlin, and he holds a master of public policy from uh, um, the Sciences Po in Paris, or Sciences Po in Paris, and the Heritage School of Governance in Berlin. His RPG contributions can be found on his blog, allesistsal.de, or allesistsal.de, and on his YouTube channel, Beta Funktion, where he hosts his actual plays of tabletop RPGs and logs. Thank you so much for coming and presenting on Character Keepers uh, this afternoon slash late night. Yeah, glad to be here. I have the honor to give you the introduction. Uh, we also provide you with the text because we have uh, something pre-written we bring to you. And we also provide you with the slides of today's talk directly in the chat. I think are the links already. In most role-playing games, play begins with character creation. In fact, the creation of characters should itself be considered part of playing a game. One could even argue that writing down persistent traits for a unique character was the most important step that allowed role-playing to emerge from wargaming in the early 1970s. In the development of character records, one can therefore try to trace the development of tabletop role-playing games in general, as well as the history of their precursors. Role-playing game studies have, however, not paid much sustained attention to character sheets, even though much of the existing literature in the field deals with character performance and the complex relationship between players and characters. In this talk, we want to contribute to addressing this lack of by discussing a version of the character sheet that has become a central aspect of online play culture in some parts of the indie tabletop RPG community, the character keeper, as a shared and emphatically digital character sheet most often realized in the form of Google Sheets spreadsheets. So we will do so in three steps. Adrian will introduce character keepers as digital character sheets. Then I will give an overview over exemplary character keepers and the history of this format. And then Adrian again presents player and designing, designer theorizing on character keepers followed by a very short and sweet conclusion. As the most important player-facing research in uh, resource in TRPGs, character sheets are, as suggested by Lars Konsek, a crucial element for keeping the textual machine of the game session running. In the sense proposed by Jessica Hammer, they can thus be considered primary, secondary, and tertiary texts. Jason Morningstar has distinguished in Anvil Game Studies in an article between the static, stable, and volatile information recorded on the character sheet. Concept's concept of characterology describes then how character sheets are not neutral, but to a certain extent determine player behavior, encouraging them and discouraging other activities. Their design can be analyzed as implementing the characterology inherent in a particular game system. Building on this, we could understand character sheets as both systemic and compound elements in the context of the theory of game elements proposed by Aki Yavinen. They contain information and serve as an interface for the player to interact with the game system and game world. In regard to their materiality, they can be described as central components of role-playing materials. How are these aspects translated to online play in the form of the digital character keeper? 
While paper character sheets can of course be used while playing TRPGs online, especially over the last decade, many forms of storing character information digitally emerged online. One way of doing so is using a so-called character keeper, a term coined by Jason Cordova, founder of the online TRPG community, The Gauntlet. Character keepers are digital character records, most often created using Google Sheets. They gather data about all of a game's characters in one place. Groups normally use no additional private sheets, digital or on paper. The Google Sheets document contains various individual spreadsheets, either one sheet per character or a single sheet for all characters, plus a variety of other sheets for additional information on game system and setting or safety tools. During the session, this information is updated in real time. All players and the facilitator or GM have editing access. These two screenshots show a relatively simple and empty 2013 character keeper for Dungeon World and a much more complex 2021 keeper in use for Brindlewood Bay, which in addition to detailed character records contains a variety of other tabs on safety, moves, mysteries, and so on. A keeper allows everyone to look up details that when using paper sheets would be mostly inaccessible on the other player's character records. Depending on the play style, this can create opportunities for collaborative narration in which players proactively address each other's characters' traits and backgrounds. While at first sight, character keepers simply function as digital equivalents of paper sheets, they therefore go beyond them in at least the following regards. First, serving as shared sheets, they allow all players to access information on all player characters. Second, many sophisticated keepers take advantage of the programming interface of Google Sheets to provide functions like drop-down selections for character options or real-time calculation of stats. Third, keepers also often track shared session and campaign notes, lists of NPCs, ongoing mysteries, etc. Fourth, the facilitator or GM can keep scenario and game state information in the keeper. Fifth, some keepers include reference information needed to play the game, basic rules, skill lists, moves, and so on often making additional materials unnecessary. Sixth, supplementary tools that facilitate play like safety tools are often integrated. And seventh, a keeper might also contain links to other accessories used during online play, dice rollers, visualization tools, and so on. These characteristics are not simply technical differences to analog character sheets, but have direct effects on the resulting play culture. This also distinguishes character keepers from other forms of digital character sheets that are often still designed as skeuomorphic digital translations of paper sheets that digitally mimic the characteristics of paper. How are character keepers actually used in online play? Most keepers are unofficial creations made available as links to a master spreadsheet template. The biggest collection is the PlayAid's Google Drive folder of the gauntlet, which collects over 400 character keepers as of June, 2021. The facilitator makes a copy of the master template, saving it in their own Google Drive. While playing, players keep a browser tab with the keeper open, referring to it and updating it. The use of character sheets or keepers is of course only one aspect of online play practices. More research is needed on how people organize their digital play spaces. How are browser windows positioned in relation to video chat software? Do players use additional resources like PDFs? And how are digital tools combined with analog instruments like pencils and physical dice? In the 2010s, playing tabletop RPGs online became increasingly popular. Quickly, Google Docs was used to keep shared notes on a play session or ongoing campaign. There seems to have been some hesitation, however, to transfer character details to a shared document, as the paper character sheet was somehow considered sacred, also interesting, and firmly remained under the player's control. But slowly, character information crept into collaborative notes. Some of the oldest Google Sheets templates that could be called character keepers were designed by Sean McCarthy in mid-2013. The first was the Dungeon World Keeper we showed before. In addition to a simple tab, we all, with all character information, it provided a GM summary with names and volatile information like armor and hit points. Other keepers created by McCarthy at the time were Fate Call, and other powered by the Apocalypse games like Apocalypse World itself and Monster Hearts. He told us, I want 
to, to avoid imposing on players to create and manage their own sheets elsewhere. Help out the other GMs and something pure dead simple to get everybody's info in one place for my selfish sanity. The concept quickly spread through the part of the indie tabletop RPG community which played online. In December 2015, Jason Cordova created a Google Drive folder to collect character keepers used by the Gauntlet community. Over the course of the next few years, Keepers became a staple of online play in a variety of indie tabletop RPG communities with blog posts describing the format and providing design tips. Keepers also, for example, showed up as part of games released through the indie marketplace HIO. In 2020, as online tabletop RPG play became much more prevalent, more and more Keepers appeared and also in many places unconnected to the gauntlet. We quickly want to present aspects of four particular Keepers. We'll make this quick. A model for many keepers were McCarthy's 2013 templates. And there you can nicely see that like all information is like vertically ordered for per character and horizontally ordered per stat or information section. And there's one keeper for monster hearts, for example, on the right, which has drop down menus, as you can see. And then there's something which is somehow the equivalent of a, a Dungeons and Dragons battle map. This is the monster hearts classroom. There is simply made in a in, a, in between cells that is used at the beginning of the game and represents like an American high school. Then there are elements like many new keepers especially have. This is a safety tools tab. This is a template which is offered in this shared folder which allows for filling out lines and veils quasi anonymously. And there you can see uh, that between these two st states Whatever is selected, the lowest color in terms of interest, line, veil, and ask first is selected. I, I guess you're aware of how lines and veils works, otherwise it's also noted down in the text. Despite many advances in the Keeper for Trophy Gold from 2021, the structure of the 2013 Dungeon World template is still visible. This is a professionally designed Keeper. Um, which features a formula control tutorial, which provides a step-by-step -step character creation guide. So here you are told to fill in your name and next step when you fill in your name, then it automatically asks you to fill in your pronouns. And in the end, when you're done, you only need to paste in your link and get the image where before the help text was. Some games use character keepers to implement mechanics that would need complex technological solutions to reproduce them offline. This is a keeper for the live action online game Outscored, which won a Golden Cobra two years ago, on which uses conditional formatting to color each player's screen depending on their character's social score. That changes depending on their actions in the game. As according to the rules, the only light illuminating the player's faces in the video call should be light emitted by the monitor. This creates a direct link between the functionality of the keeper and the atmosphere of the game. And my, maybe you can see this in my face, although I'm, I'm not sitting in the dark, so it's not such a strong effect, but maybe you see this in my face. Now I'm purple suddenly a little bit. As part of our research, we explore contemporary debates among designers, GMs, and players about character keepers in blog posts, online forums, and on blog podcasts, etc. Player theorizing is an important part of TRPG culture, culture, as highlighted by Evan Turner. In a certain sense, then, the reflections we present here are at times little more than a systematization of existing discussions within the contemporary indie TRPG scene. Most theorizing highlights benefits to either gameplay or design. In the words of Rich Rogers on the podcast Dysology, it is really an evolutionary step in how we look at our characters and how other people look at their characters. And I don't know if it's super valuable for a D&D type game, but in games where there's a lot more collaboration, where you might have certain moves that other people can set up, it is so powerful to just look across that array and just see everybody's stuff, their hooks, what they're about. I love character keepers, like I can't get away from them. The role of keepers in design and playtesting is also emphasized by Jamila Nijadi. I use a character keeper to design the game. It's much easier to play test and make changes as we play test the game. We suggest systematizing this discussion about keepers according to the different frames of TRPG play, building on Irvin Goffman's, Gary Fiennes, Daniel McCase, and Jennifer Grawling Cover's work. 
we'll give a very, very concise and limited overview of some aspects we have identified. In regard to the social frame, one advantage of using a character keeper is organizational. Keepers are described as easy to access without needing additional software creating accounts, at least for the players. More complex keepers are also considered full campaign managers with all data needed during play. They also help managing players' expectations, for example, through the use of safety tools, as we have seen. In regard to the game frame, probably the most often mentioned advantage is how shared access to character information facilitates collaborative play. However, this can also lead to power gaming seen as problematic, like looking at who would be best to do this thing. A second advantage are possibilities afforded by automation, dropdowns for stats and skills and formulas that automatically update data. These can take care of a lot of crunchy elements of a game. Too much automation, however, might make using a keeper too complicated for some players or might break the spreadsheets. Some newer keepers help streamlining the creation of characters or offer step-by-step -step guides. In addition, especially if they contain much or all reference information needed for play, keepers can contribute to learning the game. The creation of a keeper is also described as a good way of learning how to run a game. Similarly, keepers are seen as helping GMs prepare for a game session. In regard to the narrative frame, keepers are described as supporting the creation of a story in which each of the player's character special abilities and other narrative elements are regularly incorporated. In the design of character keepers, one central question being discussed is whether to put all characters on one tab or to use different tabs for each character. In this context, but also more generally, it is important to note that the practice of character keeper design very often involves copying an existing keeper and working off of this template by revising and reworking it according to the needs of a particular game. Many of today's character keepers are therefore the result of a very complex process of borrowing and cross-pollination between players, GMs, and game designers over the last decade. Also, while most keepers are still amateur products, some recent keepers were designed as professional products, turning the character keeper designer into a new role in the context of indie TRPGs. The final design-related issue is, as described by game designer Nejadi, the use of character keepers and keeper design as a tool for game design itself. Designing and playtesting in the keeper, for example, played an important role in the creation of the Powered by the Apocalypse game, Hearts of Wolin. In conclusion, we argue that in the contemporary discussions around character keepers, we can trace elements of envisioning what a character record for TRPGs as analog games can look like that is envisioned and designed as digital from the ground up. At the same time, analyzing keepers' actual effects on play culture is hardly possible by studying keepers in insulation outside of actual play. For example, the Gauntlet community in particular has not only been the center of the rise to prominence of the format of the keeper in the sense, but has collectively produced hundreds of actual play videos, which could serve as empirical material for future study of the play culture afforded by character keepers. Research in this aspect of online TRPG play is therefore just beginning. Thank you. Thank you so much. And a round of applause for uh, this exemplary work on, on a what we see as an emerging uh, digital folk format of uh, that that is definitely uh, an example of a specific play community um, in action. And uh, at this point, we'll, we we will uh, take the questions related to that uh, at the end of the panel. So stick around and stay up for a few more a few more minutes, another forty minutes, and then and then and then you're done. And at this point, um, I'm going to then turn to welcome our final pa panelists for um, this afternoon slash evening. Um, and that will be Iris Shea. So Iris, if you could uh, uh, get yourself ready, uh, turn on the camera and uh, get any slides you'd like to present uh, ready. Uh, I will present your bio. Yeah, hi, I'm here. <laughs> hi, Iris. Hello. Okay. so. Iris Shea, who uses they, them pronouns, is oh, currently in. Yeah, my, my last name is pronounced Shea. Thank you. That's what, that's what I needed, actually, was, was, was a, proper, um, a proper pronunciation. So, Iris Shea, is that, is that yeah. Iris yes, Shea? Thank you. Who uses, no, no, thank you. Uh, who uses they, them pronouns is currently an MFA uh, and design student at University of California, Davis. Their background as a second generation queer, neurodivergent, and disabled Chinese American has taken them down the paths of community organizing, writing, visual design, and now analog games. Their current research and design work is about centering 
experiences of disabled uh, QTPOC and exploring relationships between body, mind, diagnosis, and capitalistic norms. They are also a Metatopia diversity sponsorship winner in 2018, which helped them get involved in the analog games community in the first place. Welcome, Iris. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. My uh, first time doing a uh, presentation to an outside conference. I'm like really excited and nervous um, to be here with you all. Um, okay, I'm gonna just start my timer and then let's see. Well, actually, shoot. Oh my God, sorry. <laughs> Let me just share my screen. It's still confusing to me. Um, can everyone see okay? Um, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so basically uh, the title of my submission was Rest as Rebellion, Exploring Hyperproductivity and Disability Justice in Analog Games. Um, this is my bio, uh, which Evan just explained. Um, basically, um, the essential concepts that I want people to take away from this talk is that, um, you know, yes, the pandemic um, is exhausting, but uh, but something that has um, been really great ever since joining the analog um, gay two news is you know meeting so many people who are um, you know of like you know from marginalized populations, but also meeting like so many like disabled creators. And so um, in a lot of ways, I feel like what I'll be talking about today will be like um, to the crowd. But my main purpose um, in this is wanting to uh, make sure and exemplify like how welcoming I think the analog games community can be and has been um, regarding addressing um, ableistic norms and uh, building that into a uh, game mechanic design. And, um, you know, taking the, the time to introduce um, some disability justice scholars and activists um, who have like coined some terms and basically being able to describe um, what the three games that I'm presenting today in my presentation are doing and using that um, as a way to talk about what they are doing. And, you know, hopefully, um, you know, this like continues, you know, on like works that like, you know, many other scholars have also done in this field, but also like adding to the conversation of like, of, wow, you know, there's really a lot to pay attention to, um, even if it's like not like, in not, even if the creators have not said like, I am doing this because of like disability justice, it's like they're still doing it. And, and, I, and I think that that says a lot and I think it needs to be um, celebrated. So um, so specifically, like I know I cite like Jameson in terms of like, you know, like how like we are in this crisis of like, you know, late capitalism, but also I, I wanted to share, um, you know, two other particular things where um, disability justice scholar Eli Clare talks about how uh, you know, only some are granted personhood as a birthright, um, but for the rest of us who are disabled and marginalized, who must fight, um, we are in trouble. And that, um, and Jonathan Carey, who wrote uh, 24 seven ends of sleep, talks about also to like how our basic desires for sleep and rest are threatened by late capitalism's hunger um, to obliterate personhood for productivity. Um, and so basically um, through this, so research also in the in the games that I've been designing, um, I've been exploring like centering like rest and hyper productivity, like interrogations of hyper productivity specifically um, through analog games, and also like asking how we can actually uh, challenge these norms and honor access needs while using play to practice uh, resistance and community care. Um, and this is very much based in uh, the practices and amazing work that's been done um, from those who have coined and brought up like and cemented like the disability justice um, community. Uh, you know, it's based in queer disabled of women of color and activist organizing, and it is a framework that examines disability and ableism as it relates to other forms of oppression and identity, such as um, race, class, gender, sexuality, citizenship, incarceration, size, etc. Uh, who, um, who is a, a co-founder of Sins Invalid, which is a disabled uh, performing arts and media group. Um, like specifically a quote that Patricia shares is that, or Byrne shares that, of igniting small persistent fires of rebellion in everyday life while envisioning a world which celebrates us in all of our myriad beauty. And I think like this really exemplifies like how I feel whenever I play like analog games that um, like, like, you know, like I said before, like maybe not intentionally 
are doing through this, or maybe like even the creators themselves, like maybe they are, um, you know, out about their disability status or like, you know, in varying different ways. Um, but, you know, either way, um, those lenses still go into the game mechanics. Um, and so, and, and, you know, to top it off, like basically uh, what I also wrote about um, in my abstract submission was um, about rest mechanics. And, you know, rest mechanics is still something that I'm working on defining and I welcome, you know, any thoughts or like things that I should be reading or if you want to talk about it. Um, but basically, I'm looking at it as anything that loosely like uh, restores like a character status but may challenge productivity and production and capitalist times. But, you know, it's funny, like, as I was putting together this presentation, I also may realize, like, oh, what if there's, like, a meta, like, you know, quality to it? And, like, what about, like, the player's, like, emotional, physical status, which is what I also think I'm getting at um, with the games that I'm demonstrating. So the first game that I'll be talking about is My Jam, which is uh, written by Jeff Deterley and Eric Mersman. Um, it is a LARP where players embody high school musarks who are magicians whose powers are focused through music at the biggest dance of the year. Uh, during the dance, you'll be able to hang with your friends, pick arguments with your frenemies, and move over your crush like any other high school dance. Uh, but when your music is playing, you become the most powerful being on the dance floor and maybe the entire gymnasium. At the end of the night, one of you will be elected the dance monarch and enact a powerful ritual that, that can permanently change the world. Um, as disclosure, I also worked as um, a layout designer on this game as well. Um, so in particular, what I wanted to like emphasize and what and like um, about rest and resistance is that um, the safety tool section um, was like really fascinating. And like, and I, you know, I, I love how much like the safety tools, like, you know, like, you know, the, like the X card and like, you know, all those things are very, very like, just like so important. And that in itself is like, you know, multiple, multiple talks I've been given. But I think specifically um, why I chose this game is that I feel it is very, very accessible to both those who are like, you know, new to LARPs or new to analog games, uh, while also accessible to those who are coming from other different community organizing settings. Like one of the first things that really struck me um, coming into the analog games community was that um, as like when I was an co-organizer for closed um, queer Asian Pacific Islander spaces, American spaces, I also, um, we had agreements, but we called them like community agreements. Um, but they actually function the same in a lot of similar ways as safety tools because we had like a purpose to gather and we were there and there are certain things that you would want to do to make sure of the safety of everyone involved in the space. So um, in particular, why I think this uh, game, My Jam, to me also uh, emphasizes rest and resists capitalism is that um, I think it's, I think it's especially the slower mechanism where it's like slower, like we can dance if we want to, and we can tell our friends to slow down. Like now in like a violent, um, and now there's so many things about like, you know, as we all know about, you know, issues with like consent and, you know, going to that. And I firmly believe that like, um, issues with consent culture also has to deal with like wider expectations about like being, you know, like that like as disabled people, like what we can give is like not good enough for the capitalistic system. And so therefore we have to like violate our own needs um, and therefore put in ourselves like in harm in order to fulfill like another person's desire. Um, and so slower is a way of going like, no, like, sorry, this, this is supposed to be a space of enjoyment. Like I'm here to enjoy being here. And, and you know, as a way to like interrupt that continual narrative that we are always supposed to emphasize. Um, and, you know, and the rest of these also talk about like having, you know, like protection, like, you know, even just like, if you look, just look at the word itself, like, you no, know, if we want to is repeated several times in the summary of these instructions, we have circle of protection, we have all of these things. And, you know, it's, um, you know, and like maybe it's just because I'm still fairly new to the scene, like, you know, this still seems really um, exceptionally novel and very captivating. And, and especially as someone who um, personally has felt unsafe many times, like saying no, because like I am too tired or I'm not really sure what's going on with me or et cetera. Um, the fact that my jam literally has an instruction in the rule book going like, um, 
what is it? The player is always the most important. Wow. That like really, you know, that really like, uh, like turned a lot of gears in me. So, you know, that's why I introduced my jam. Um, so the next game that I'm going to discuss is, um, pin feathers slash cloud studies It's actually two games, but I'm just going to focus on one for now. Um, it's a LARP that's designed by Jian Shim. And, uh, basically, um, I thought this game was so interesting, primarily because of the fact that it, it so it, so what's interesting is that it explicitly names like you are healing, you are transforming, like it has very like visceral language that is supposed to like put you into a certain place. So while like my jam, you know, may have you, you know, like enter like, you know, a high school, like school space, which already, you know, has a lot of its own implications. A lot of people have their own associations with it. If, you know, if you happen to be a player that, you know, is familiar with the high school dance experience, um, like uh, Pin Feathers wants to seek out like a different form of abstraction where it's like instead it's it's connecting to like your body mind and like you know what is happening to you um like as you are existing like in the space and it's asking these prompts it's asking these questions which you know is often like you know like not just somewhere to like you know what most people know as like mindfulness but also like you know as someone who has um chronic illnesses and is disabled and had to have come to terms with like several times of both like material and um, an acknowledgement and acceptance and then that cycle over and over again, um, I can play this game at any time in my life and record, you know, different observations because my state fluctuates from day to day. And, um, and, you know, and it's funny because there are, there's a lot of times when I, I think it's really important to note that um, ableism is so violent because it's all about being dismissive of a norm. It's like, uh, it's, it's being dismissive of norms that are not supportive of capitalistic productivity. And so in, in acknowledging experiences that can constantly change and constantly flux, um, that is really, really significant and really important, especially, you know, with the prompt of like the second one that says like, what are you eager to leave behind you in the wake of your new body? And, you know, that can be ap applicable to like, you know, like trans experiences to like, you know, disabled experiences, you know, like yearning about like, I wish I could leave my body or, or like, you know, like I have left my body. Like um, there's a lot of ways to engage with it. Um, and then the final thing that I wanted to share um, is, is this delightful uh, game that I played uh, called Dandelion Factory by Ann Rashett. Um, basically, I was lucky enough to be a playtester for this game, and it's super fun. Um, and this also discusses more about parody and hyper productivity culture and, you know, capitalistic joy culture. Like, you know, think of those like really, really weird stock photos. Um, and like basically to summarize like uh, this game is that um, imagine that you're like a high C-suite corporate executive um, that has to, you know, manage like wish fulfillment. And basically the stakes are like really, really high is that you're supposed to maximize happiness for these lowly humans. Um, but you also gotta maximize happiness of the C-suite. And so you have to like, you know, come together as department heads and address the problems and attempt to find solutions or to find a policy. Um, and then you have to negotiate the terms and you kind of like feel out like, oh, what are the norms in the space, right? So, so when we were playing this game, it was it was super funny because um, for the most part <laughs> we realized how much we carried with us like what was capitalism to the point that we started um, making really absurdist like parodies of experiences that that like you know I'm pretty sure like almost all the players um, were disabled and had struggles with capitalism like in the play space and you know we started making fun of it and it just really you know really opens up the fact that there is such a huge need for valuable critiques and having you know playful ways of engaging with like traumatizing systems in a way that doesn't re-traumatize the player and i thought the underlying factory was very really successful for that so i recommend you know you know i recommend playing any of these games but the underlying factory is very fun um and to, to finish up to top it off like basically and conclude um basically all of these games encourage us to critique uh, bio-deregulation and chrononormativity. Uh, bio-deregulation, as coined by Teresa Brennan, talks about how um, 
humans work harder to conform to the rules of inhuman time. And Elizabeth Freeman uh, offers a complementary theory called chrononormativity, uh, which is based in queer theory, where one uses a normative time to direct human bodies towards maximum productivity. So in closing, basically games are really important for helping us address ableist ideologies, norms, and violence that is grounded in cis heteronormative white ableist supremacy. And game mechanics can help us untangle these associations and imagine much more expansive ways of beings uh, that can be uh, much more healing and humorous for our body and minds. Um, yeah, and so that's the end of my presentation. So thank you. So. Thank you so much, Iris. Um, and uh, thanks everybody for for uh, the, the enthusiasm that you that you have been and now are now showing uh, in the chat. This was a, a great talk and a great um, ending to this panel to think about you know the role of rest in design, not just activities. And I was thinking this is also a good overview of theories of time that resist the the, the time that grinds us to dust, especially those of us who have different abilities than others. I'm going to turn to the Q&A and invite you to put more questions in the Q&A as, as we only have uh, Greg Loring Albright and he actually ran off. So, so I'm going to still ask his question. And then I, I, I implore you all to, to put in some, uh, some questions in the Q&A or I might have to come up with something as moderator. We have about 20 minutes for discussion. Uh, Greg Loring Albright is, is uh, talking specifically to Mike and Carly. Thanks for the keep, get, Keepsake Games shout out. I'm curious, relating to my own conceptualization of Keepsake Games, as to whether or to what degree you conceptualize the creation of artifacts as the point of Golden Mart. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I'll jump in. Uh, I think it's like, I think it's like kind of the point, but kind of not the point the same way that like making a scrapbook is not the point of living your life, but you might make a scrapbook as part of being alive or of documenting what you're doing as you move through your life. Um, I love like physical artifacts. I love like little junky things. I'm a pack rat. I used to work in a toy store. Like, um, but I also like I think, I don't know, I think my relationship with those things is like a little complicated, right? And so you're like making the thing and the process of making it is valuable, but not necessarily like keeping it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, from the design side, I remember the the incident report was one of the early things that Carly came up with and pitched and um, it really helped focus the design of the process. So it's also interesting to think about keepsake from the designer's perspective uh, in this case where um, that really helped us um, concentrate on what we wanted the player to do once the game ended. Uh, one, one commonality I'm noticing between all of the talks is the importance of communities in affecting the design, right? And, and that, that it kind of, in some ways, um, it deconstructs this notion of the lone genius, you know, coming up with their RPG in isolation, but rather, you know, very much bringing in, um, you know, inspirations from people around them and, 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 um, and the communities of play that are, it's both intended for and, and probably inspire the, the game in first place. So um, that's a question to all um, is, is what, uh, what role does communities or specific communities have in your, you know, conception of play and design? Um, if I can, so do we all talk or do we? Yeah, 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 Iris, you're, you, you, you're, you're on the spot, so please. Um, so, so for me, it's like, a, as someone who, um, you know, is in touch with a lot of different communities. And it's funny how much overlap and no, not overlap that I, I experience. Like I have friends who have no idea that I'm a game designer, um, but I've met them through like, you know, queer organizing or like, or I've met them in like, you know, my like professional design circles and then they're like, whoa, like, wait, hold on a second, you know? And, and, um, and what ends up happening is that Initially, I, I used to be really scared and like isolated that I couldn't really engage in conversations like this with anybody who like, 
you know, like wasn't like 100% in like the analog game scene. But what I kind of realized is like, I think people are always thinking about this and always trying to find different ways of engaging with it. And there's a lot of potential in terms of um, in increasing engagement with a bunch of different communities while also like amplifying and bringing out like already what is being done in analog games community and like what and how much more and how much has been done and how much more can be done. So, I mean, I, I feel very positive and like optimistic about it. Like overall, I think it's just, there's a lot that can be done. And, you know, community is I think central to um, making these connections and kind of giving this space like a lot of life and stuff, so. Thank you. I'll step in a little bit, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so yeah, one of the things that Anza Dua specifically talks about in, in, um, in her later works were uh, what the self can do to help the community, right? Um, in the, the space of a TTRPG, it's, it seems like it should be a lot tougher to, uh, to broaden that out, but it's not. Like what you're doing is you're providing an example of what you want in that space and hoping that that example is then taken up by everyone else and then reflected again and again, and essentially kind of uh, expounds itself to the point where everyone is cooperating, right? Everyone is providing the same level of engagement and thoughtfulness and, and care uh, that you wanted out of it, right? And everyone at that point is in also getting something uh, for themselves, right? It, it's, so it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, and honestly, uh, I played for a very long time, as we mentioned before. Uh, it's not something that I had truly seen or, or experienced until maybe the last like 10 or 15 years worth of games where I was really reaching out to like, indie stuff, right? To, to stuff that is uh, being produced by, by individuals rather than uh, large groups of people. And, and you get the idea that this person's designing an experience for everyone. Right, and you want to participate in that as well. Yeah. I, and and at, at this point, then um, I'm going to turn back to my, my question and answers I, again. I, I think the the um, the the what, what what keeps coming up to me is, is this idea of mutuality, right? And 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 you know, in the past ten to fifteen years with indie design, there's been a uh, an act of seeing, you know, the end players in a much, I think, clearer light, and not just as users, right, or, or or consumers of this game, but as real people who will receive the text and and use it. Uh, which I also think it relates to the character keepers uh, uh, argument. In some ways, these informal practices actually become the game, right? I I, I uh, barely use, you know, for example, the apocalypse keys. Um, you know, Jamila Najati was 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 cited here, so I'm I'm going to use it. I I rarely use the apocalypse keys. Um, rule set for any reason because I have a character keeper that has everything in it right so I'm just navigating a spreadsheet and it's hard to tell my friends oh I navigate the spreadsheet and I'm having a hell of a time it's 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 so wonderful but at the same time this this spreadsheet is magical it's doing all these things and 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 that that that's you know from a layers of community practice that's again mutual it's it's saying how can we get the the, the players and the designers to to meet somewhere in the middle through technology and 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 also in a place where I don't think anyone's really making money. I don't know. Is anyone making money off character keepers? That's my question. Well, there are people who get paid for making character keepers. Yes, I'm one of them, by the way, because uh, I can probably say that I was hired by the Make a Scene Love Anthology makers to create online versions, including character keepers of all the games. But is it making money? That's a different question because it's still uh, a labor of love and, and passion and not appropriate for the kind of amount of work you put in there. But it doesn't go that go for most of indie RPG work. So in that regard, right. I wouldn't say so. I mean, there's so much do-it-yourself culture behind it that I have to admit that I'm personally also a little bit hesitant like and skeptic about professionalization of this. It builds on the work of others. If you make this proprietary, for example, that's 
that's the end of the story, I would say, because it's like building on others, improving the safety template, for, for example, which is shown. This is updated like every two months or so. It gets an, an improvement or it takes a different direction. Now, for example, suddenly it was interesting for people who are colorblind that they are unhappy with certain colors, so we improved that. Then somebody included had a romance game, which they played. So let's include a table for romance options in the game. So I think this is how, how they move forward. And then it's very different, difficult to attribute like who should get paid for which proportion of this. Yeah, that also echoes what's going on in LARP right now, where if you actually try to pay everything, you know, pay for it for all of the duties that people are doing in LARP, you it will make it unaffordable, like a six thousand dollar Star Wars hotel, um, which I'm not complaining about. I'm just saying that's the price, right? If you want to make a profit off of LARP, you have to charge an obscene amount, which means that most of us in the LARP scene are not making money uh, and and are doing it out of passion because it's very difficult to make profitable with all the different roles. And and this also so so in some ways it has to remain a kind of community practice. And now I've got a full a full slate of questions so um uh haley asks uh i was interested in the term community care that iris brought up i would be interested in hearing from all the panelists now how, how care has played a role in your work as a designer or player i'll jump in since we're all staring at each other um I actually, that's something I think about a lot and something that's really important to me. I'm very engaged in um, Buy Nothing, which is uh, like a, it's a giving economy, right? And I also engage in a lot of kind of mutual aid work in my neighborhood and in my community. Um, I'm always interested in, in kind of like how we take care of each other, right? Like I think we're all building the world we want to live in, like every single day with all the choices we make. Um, and I try to make games that echo that kind of world or at least like maybe make you think about that kind of world um i'm in addition to the game mike and i are working on the other game i'm working on right now is actually about like anarcho syndicalist witches and it's about like um a group of like basically as witches you come together and you like solve problems for the towns and that's very much in line with kind of like how i think about the world and also like what i think i'm supposed to be doing with my time right like is solving problems and like making things less crappy um so i don't know i think a lot of times for me game design is pretty utopic right like i'm making games that kind of imagine a world that i would like to live in or i'd like to spend more time in If anyone else wants to, to, to chime in, they're welcome to, or else we can move on. It depends. Yeah, I just want to um, echo that, maybe talk a bit about uh, my other project, it's aside from Golden Mart, but also like the um, way Carly and I are approaching the Kickstarter is uh, to actually, for Golden Mart, to actually um, pay people for the labor that they're doing to expand this project. Um, and that includes paying writers that we want to write campaigns and um, paying for sensitivity sensitivity readers because um, you know we don't want people to be traumatized or triggered by the content in the work or misrepresent something and I, th I think that also is something that um, games should should think about care a little bit like how you're representing something that that's been really touched on in this this conference this year um, which I think is great to talk about. And it, actually, th this this is um, an interesting question, re again, regarding the commercialization of any of these things, I, right? right. Um, uh, Tim asks, are there topics we're touching on, including inclusivity, representation, or community source resources that are inherently non-commercial, or is there some desired future state of the industry or community that involves buy-in by the larger game or publishers providers. So that it, in other words, uh, you know, it, should the industry or, or some sort of larger commercial enterprise eventually take up some of this care work? I, I kind of don't want them to. Um, I. I would, I want people to unionize and have better workplaces. Like I want that thing to happen. I also don't want the things I do because I'm passionate about them and I love them to become a profit engine for someone else. Um, and I also don't want the community work I'm doing 
now that I value that makes my neighborhood nice and makes makes us a place where we're taken care of. I don't want that to be organized and formalized in a way that suddenly it becomes hard to access. Whereas right now you can just be like, hey, I need size five jeans for my kid because they outgrew all their clothes and I have no money and I get paid next week and we'll take care of you, right? Like I, I, I want us to be able to take care of each other. I don't want everything to go through ch proper channels all the time. Yeah, and, and and again, I think it becomes a liability in, in the creative sphere where you say, I'm going to try this thing and it really doesn't work on a commercial level. And I don't want to build a business model. I just want to build a game that people could play and it's fine. Um, and, and a lot of Kickstarters, I think, from the itch scene are also definitely about just paying people to do things, but that there's not some larger profit model on top of that. Um, this is a, then we have a, a um, question for, uh, for Iris, but also for Jose. Um, I'd be interested in hearing more about connections you've drawn between activist communities and gaming communities. Do you find many practices or ideas that cross over between your gaming and your activist communities? Jose, if you would want to go first, because if you, if you would want to answer this, so. Sorry, sorry, I'm going, but go ahead. Uh, if you want to, that's fine. Okay. Well, I mean, like, I've already talked about it a little bit in my presentation, so if you wanted to answer this question. Okay. Um, certainly. So the, the thing that I've noticed since I work mostly with, with teens and, and preteens is that um, using games to kind of I say teach, because that sounds a little too harsh, but uh, make them uh, more prone to be aware of the situation in society around them, it it makes them better people as they go along. Uh, so I started that program in 2015. Uh, the oldest is now 20. And he's moved on to actually, he's in college. He's working with a lot of uh, community groups in Austin, actually, where, where he's going to school. And he credits the idea to just the, the stories that we were telling and the ideas that were being uh, seeded into each one, right? Like, it's, again, providing... Uh, instances of reflection uh, for the players in order for them to pick up on it, dwell on it a little bit somewhere within them, and then come out with an answer for themselves. That's super cool. Wow. Um, I guess I'll do another. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll do another quick addition. Um, what I, so what's been interesting, and I can share this anecdote is that, um, when I was doing community organizing and at UC Davis in my undergrad, um, which was between like 2010 and 2015, um, there wasn't like many, like I think game spaces especially to like really participate in. And like, I think a lot of us were really like supercharged and like having a lot of access to social justice and like doing stuff. Um, but what I noticed about um, the queer folks and the, and the cutie pop folks um, at UC Davis um, after Trump was elected was that um, the environment went less like, oh, let's like talk about social justice topics and like organize to being like, okay, like we're really exhausted and terrified about what's going on because we have white supremacists on our campus. Um, what's a safe place to be? And so um, actually like tabletop groups and um, LARP groups actually ended up becoming very popular um, as like workshops and regular meetings. And, and so I, I think it's like one of those cases where I feel like now, um, I mean, there's also like other commentary about how like mental health is kind of dominating the conversation over like intersectionality and the implications of like wider meta narratives. But, uh, but I think overall, if um, my viewpoint is that as long as we don't forget like, like core key terms and like core understandings of what's both in like activist organizing communities and within like analog uh, game communities and like these particular concepts and having an interface, which is why in my presentation, I like, you know, spend so much time defining stuff. Um, it, it leads to like less confusion and like less like, I think like bad faith understanding versus like good faith, because really it's like a lot of it is just making sure that people 
like can understand and know the context for what's going on because otherwise you're gonna get like really bad hot takes like yeah like like you know like some game encourages some bad thing and it's like oh my god no like not at all can we like get rid of that take so um so that's like the main overlap that i've been seeing is it's it's been very interesting and also a lot of queer, people, queer folks i know during the pandemic have started gaming a lot more and like I know like so many people who've like reached out to me and been like, yeah, I started playing like D and D like, wow. Like I know you're a game designer. Do you recommend any other games? And I'm like, wow, that is so new. Let me dig out my list. So it is, it has been a very interesting experience in the last year, especially. Well, that is our time together. So I want to again, thank um, our extraordinary panelists for a, a, a wonderful round of talks, again, dealing with RPG design, probably in ways that have never been traditionally discussed in some sort of conference like this. So I, I think this is a, a very forward thinking panel and I, I look forward to also what, what all of you do in your design spaces uh, and in your community spaces going forward. Thank you so much and uh, have a pleasant, uh, afternoon and or evening now that we're moving into evening in the united states so uh thank you everybody and uh and and again we our final thank panel <laughs> thank you and our final panel is is at six o'clock p.m edt and uh, is on dungeons and dragons so stay tuned <laughs>